cancel on me yesterday, which means I'd have to come up with, uh, with two talks. I know Paul says, be ready in season and out of season to preach. And so I, I was ready yesterday. But then they got their power back and they made the long slog over and I was getting updates. He was supposed to be here at four o'clock and then five o'clock. And did you get to eat, brother? Okay. <laughs> well, that's great. I want to call up uh, Alan Foster, our missions conference speaker. Alan will also be preaching um, for us tomorrow. And, you know, when Jason canceled just a few days ago, my first thought was, I want to hear my brother Alan preach. You were my first go-to. I want you to know, I didn't go down a list. You were it. <laughs> if you said no, it was me. And they, <laughs> and they hear a lot from me already. Uh, so, so just to, <clears throat> so Alan and Kim have been on the mission field, what, like a dozen years now? Or yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, he, he is in charge of, for a minute, mission in North America with the PCA, church planter recruiting and training and here's the thing, the PCA has set a huge goal for church planting. We have 2,000 churches that are Presbyterian Church in America across the country, and in the next 10 years, they want to grow by 50%. Now, we want good growth. We want the growth, we want to be the right growth. And uh, I'm so glad you're working in this. And thank you for, for bringing the word to us. So I'll let you uh, read and pray and everything. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thanks, George. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It is good to be here. Kim and I love coming to Meadowview. Um, it's one of our favorite places. Um, you all support us so well. Uh, financially, we get cards on our anniversary and a gift check. You all just really take care of us as, as missionaries, and we just can't thank you enough for that. Um, as George said, I'm uh, my title with uh, at Mission to North America is Director of Church Planting Resources, and that's just a big title for I'm the church planting answer man. Um, I coach planters. I work with trying to get new planters in the pipeline. I help them find places to plant where we need them across the country. I coach planters. I work with location leaders who are looking for ways to plant new churches in their area, helping them with strategies and plans. Um, so it's just sort of a grab bag of, of church planting um, needs and, and resources. Again, we love to be here with you all. Y'all are dear to us, one of our favorite churches here. Um, and this almost didn't happen. I mean, George called me Monday morning, texted me. I called him as I was driving to the doctor. Uh, I had been in the bed all day Saturday, all day Sunday. I picked up some kind of bug um, last week and, and was just beat, just exhausted. And I thought, well, let's go to the doctor and make sure there's nothing, you know, that's diagnosed or not gotten into in, in my lungs or whatever. So I was driving to the doctor, and George said, can you preach? I said, well, Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> uh, if, I can, if I get enough strength back by Wednesday, I'll let you know. So Wednesday came along, and I felt like I was, was gaining strength again. Didn't have a, a bad cough or anything like that, so it was just, just fatigue. Well, then Hurricane Helena made her um, entrance into our world this past week here, and we didn't have any power. We lost power, what, Friday, yesterday morning, I believe. And we're without power all day. So I texted and called George again. I said, well, I'm, I'm feeling much better, but we have no power. And if we have no power tomorrow morning, I hadn't been in the shower in two days. So you don't want me to come, you know. Um, but last night about 10 o'clock, the lights came on and, and we're up and running. So and then it took us an extra hour and a half to get here traffic and construction and I bet there were four wrecks between Spartanburg and just outside of Charlotte so I'm glad not to be on the road I'm glad to be here it's good to see all of you all um, would you stand with me and let me read from the scriptures we're going to focus tonight on a passage from the gospels tomorrow night as well as a passage from the gospels our theme as you see here, is the heart of Christ for a fallen world. We will look to identify one aspect of that tonight, another aspect tomorrow. 
Luke 15, very familiar passage. We're going to begin in verse 1 through 10. We'll read verses 1 through 10. The first two parables of this three parable set here. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them a parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Well, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Well, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. You may be seated, please. And let's pray together as we look at this passage together. Father, we are thankful for what has brought us together tonight, the chance to fellowship together, to encourage each other through time spent around the table, and to hear reports from uh, what you're doing around the world. We've heard a report about what you're doing through the Sheds of Hope ministry to help those who have had tragedies, and we've heard from Pastor Yin uh, about the way that you're using him, gathering Sudanese Christians and others in an international church there in Jamestown, just a few miles up the road here. Father, we will hear from more missionaries tomorrow. We are thankful for the chance to, again, hear what you're doing through your servants across the world. We commit our evening together to you tonight, Father. Uh, we pray for the power and the work of the Holy Spirit that he will take the truths of this passage and will apply them to our hearts tonight. Uh, and we ask this prayer for the uh, encouragement of your people. We as your people will leave here encouraged and strengthened, uh, reminded again of your great love for us through Christ. And we ask this prayer in his name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we've read these two parables, and they're, they're two parables in a series of three. And of course, you probably know the third parable, the parable of the lost son. That's the one that gets the most airtime. Uh, but these parables will talk about God's heart for his children who were lost. Uh, first, there's a shepherd who leaves a hundred sheep, leaves them behind, searches for the one that's lost. Then there's the woman that sweeps her house clean, searching for a lost coin. Uh, then there's the father who welcomes his wayward son home with a ring and a new robe and a, and a celebration banquet. And in each of these parables, the focus really is on God. Uh, not so much about the other characters in the story, but, but on God Himself. Each parable gives us a different insight as to how God responds to His people who were lost and sinning. This, morning we're going to, or this, this evening we're going to focus on the second parable of the set, uh, the second one on the lost coin. Uh, but as I... As we talk through this parable, I want you to, uh, to lock in on the actions and the feelings of this woman. Uh, because the, Jesus is telling this parable, she's representing the actions and the feelings of God as he searches for those who were lost, those of his, who were lost in sin. Listen again to verse 8. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? Now, we've got a woman. She's got ten silver coins. Now, this is not like us if we're getting our groceries into the car there in the parking lot of the grocery store and we drop a quarter. 
Because we're not going to search high and low for that quarter. It's just a quarter, you know. You wouldn't spend much time looking for it. You wouldn't lose much sleep if you didn't find it. And you wouldn't call your neighbors together to celebrate it when you did find it. You know, uh, these, these silver coins were probably her dowry. Uh, now, we don't have dowries these days, but they did then. And a dowry is the money that the family of the bride would give to the groom, the husband, when they got married. It, it cemented the relationship together, and it was probably the thing that this woman brought into this relationship. Uh, and the fact that it's only a small amount. Um, each of these coins was probably about equal to a day's wage. So all she brought into the marriage was ten days' wages worth of money. Uh, shows how poor she was and uh, how poor this couple were. It's also likely that she wore these coins in some way, maybe a bracelet, uh, maybe around her neck as a necklace, maybe on her head as so, a sort of a headband. Uh, so this would have been like, uh, ladies, one of you all um, losing your, your wedding ring, your engagement ring. Um, so the coins not only had financial worth to someone so poor, they had sentimental significance. So it's no wonder that she searches the house all over to try to find it. Now look at the three things she does here in verse 8 in order to find this precious coin. First, she lights a lamp. Now the reason she would light a lamp is being a, a more of a poor person, her home probably did not have windows. Maybe, maybe a slit just at the top of the house, maybe on both sides for ventilation's sake. Uh, but probably not a window at all. So, uh, there wasn't much light in the house. Uh, it was dark. Um, and given her lower financial class, uh, burning oil, precious oil in the middle of the day, uh, was just not done. Uh, and most of her work was done outside anyway. Cooking was done outside. She kept her garden outside. She did her other chores with the other ladies in the village outside. Much cooler, and it was dark inside, you know. So lamps were lit only at night and only when necessary. Uh, but she didn't care. Um, she had to find that coin. And she was going to do whatever it took. Burn costly oil uh, if it took that to find this coin. The second thing she does is she takes her broom and she sweeps that house clean. I mean, I can just imagine her going all over this house, sweeping, dust flying everywhere, hoping she will hear that coin as she sweeps, bounce off a piece of furniture up against a wall, locating, trying to locate that coin. Um, and finally, it says that she searches diligently. Uh, who knows how much necessary work she didn't do, you know? Uh, how much time she wasted uh, trying to look for this coin. Uh, the laundry didn't get done. The cleaning was neglected. Uh, did her husband get mad at her? <laughs> I don't know. You know. Uh, did her neighbors think she was foolish for wasting so much time? Uh, I mean, here she was inside of her house during the day with a lamp lit, sweeping up a storm, stirring up a ruckus. Uh, she wasn't outside with the other ladies in the village doing the chores, working together, working her garden, whatever the case was. And we don't know how long it took her to find this coin. Did she look for a couple of hours? For a day? For a couple of days? A week? We don't know. It just says that she searched diligently until she found it. She didn't quit searching until she found it. Um, this happened to us recently. You remember, Kim thought she lost her wedding ring. 
We were driving somewhere. I forgot. I think we were in North Carolina. Don't you think we were? I think we were. We had been somewhere on some ministry trip, and all, and she's in the passenger seat, and I'm driving, and we were talking or listening to something on the radio, and all of a sudden she says, where's my wedding ring? Our engagement ring, I guess it was. And it wasn't on her finger. And she didn't know where it was. And she, I mean, she looks in the seat around her. She looks in the floorboard. Of course, Kim is, is rather of short personage, you know. So for her to sit and lean over to look, it, it took a lot of effort, you know, look on the floor and the seat. She started taking stuff out of her purse. She couldn't find, and she, she was panicking. She was in tears. Honey, what am I going to do? Where is this? She was apologizing to me. I've lost the ring that you bought. Um, at some point, you found it. And maybe, I don't know, 10 minutes of searching and weeping, and finally she found it. And I mean, she really did rejoice, you know. I found, now, if, I guess if we'd been home, we could have called neighbors, you know, um, just like this lady did. Uh, she she was happy. She was celebrating. She finally found a ring that she thought was lost. So, And that's happened to you all. You've lost something. You've misplaced something. You can't find it where you thought you left it. Something precious. We know how this woman felt. Look at verse 9. <clears throat> and when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. So she finally finds it. She calls together friends and neighbors to tell them the great news. Of course, they probably knew she was looking. They saw the dust from the inside of the house, you know. Rejoice with me, she says. She celebrates, she sings, she dances. She, uh, others are joining her in this celebration. Now, look at verse 10. If you've got your Bibles, I would love for you to look at verse 10. Uh, to me, this is the most significant part of this parable. At this point, Jesus says this, Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So at this point, Jesus finishes telling the story, and he makes a comment about it. Now, if you've read this parable or even the three in this series, you are probably familiar with how the parable ends. Um, heaven rejoices when a sinner repents. Um, in fact, that's exactly what it says in verse 7. If you can look at your Bible, look at verse 7, the story of the lost sheep. Jesus says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. But that's not exactly what it's saying here in verse 10. A little bit of a difference. Look at it again. There it says there is joy in heaven. But in verse 10 it says there is rejoicing before the angels of God. Now, it means much the same thing. But let me ask you. Who is it that is before the angels of God? Who holds court, as it were, before the angels of God? It's God. God is the one who is before His angels. Uh, folks, God is the one rejoicing. Heaven may be rejoicing, but it's because the God of heaven got it started. You know? Um, if the God of heaven is singing, everybody's singing with Him. You know? Um, if the angels are rejoicing, it's because God got the rejoicing started. Um, if there's dancing going on, it's because God is the one who is leading the dancing. And some would say that this parable simply refers to people becoming Christians, repenting of their sins and coming to faith in God for the first time. But that's not what it says. All right? It simply mentions sinners who repent. 
And that's us. Um, that's us. Uh, that's you, that's me, that's those outside of the faith who do come to faith in Christ. Every time a sinner repents, heaven rejoices. Um, every time you repent, every time I repent, um, heaven um, erupts in applause. Every time you repent, heaven gives you a standing ovation. Every time you repent, heaven celebrates. And God Himself is the one who is leading it up. Who is singing the loudest and rejoicing the biggest and laughing the hardest and dancing the longest. Because nothing makes God happier than when... His people repent. Um, you see, folks, God is just not impressed with our good behavior. <laughs> right? Um, that's not what makes Him the happiest. Um, he's not impressed with how much money you may give to the church, how much time you may spend doing ministry, how much sacrifice you... Uh, take part of in order to do what God's called you to do. But when you repent, that's when God takes notice. That's what grabs His attention. That's what, that's what makes Him rejoice. And why is that? Why is it that, that repentance is what captures God's heart? Um, it's because... When you repent, you are telling God with the loud voice of your actions that you prefer Him over all other things. When you repent and turn away from finding your hope and your joy and your peace and your contentment, not in your job, not in your spouse, not in your stuff, but when you begin finding your hope and joy and peace and contentment, in who Jesus is for you. And that's what makes God rejoice. It's like He says, they're finally getting it. They're finally seeing how much better I am than anything else they could put their hope and trust in. Um, makes God happy when you come to your senses and admit the truth that He is good, that He can be trusted, that He is all that you need. When you repent, you tell God that you desire Him above all other things. Above the temporary pleasures of this world. And when you do that, you draw attention to the great worth of God. Nobody brags about being hungry. They brag about the food that satisfies their hunger. It's why God rejoices, because you're bragging on how good He is, how much better He is than anything else. I think, folks, what that means is this. Repentance is not so much a change in your behavior as it is a change in what you desire. It's a change in what brings joy to your soul. It's a change in what satisfies you. To repent is not simply confessing a wrong this or that. It's not apologizing to God, you know. God, I'm sorry I lost my temper with the kids. God, I'm sorry I'm worried about our finances. Um, repentance is less about your actions and more about your desires. Um, it's not so much about what you do as it is about what you want. Um, and so to repent is really to admit a wrong direction in life. Um, it's really about owning uh, a faithless heart. Um, you see, to repent is to admit that you've got a lustful, craving heart, one whose tendency is to go anywhere else but Jesus uh, for hope and joy and peace, security. Um, and it's, it's really the backside of faith. 
If living by faith is living by the truth that God is good and that He can be trusted, then when we admit that we don't believe that God is good and that He can be trusted, that's what repentance is. Um, is to be more and more convinced that the blessings that this world has to offer don't compare uh, to those that joy that God promises. Uh, you know, folks, too often I think we think that repentance is just sort of an effort at beating ourselves up, you know. Um, and we've got this um, image of God in heaven with a big paddle or a big finger He's shaking at us, you know, and telling us we better shape up. Um, but the true, uh, true repentance really it comes from the Holy Spirit, it, and it comes in the context of love. Um, really, what, what repentance is, if you can think of it like this, it's, it's sitting in the lap of your Heavenly Father um, long enough for the piercing gaze of His love to finally break your heart. That's what repentance is. Um, Romans 2 4 says it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Let me, let me phrase it like this. How many of you all, or parents, have, have ever hugged your child when that child did not want to be hugged? <laughs> right? Um, you're hugging him or her and you're squeezing and he is squirming and pushing and trying to get out from your love and you won't let it happen. He can't escape because your love is too strong. Folks, repentance is the hug of God to resistant sinners that finally melts our stubborn heart. <laughs> if I were to ask you what makes God happier, what impresses Him, if you will, what strikes Him, um, your your stellar behavior, or your repentance. Most of us would instinctively say good behavior, you know. But that's not what this parable says. God rejoices more over repentance than He does over our good works. Um, because God is holy and pure and perfect and just, then he's just, we just can't measure up to his goodness, right? Um, our efforts at goodness can't compare to who he is. And besides, the only goodness and righteousness and uh, justice that ever impressed God was the goodness and righteousness and justice of his son Jesus. And ours won't ever come close. In fact, the only thing we have to bring to God is our repentance. We, we, we can't bring our good behavior to God. It's, it's filthy rags, as the Bible tells us. Even our best actions are tainted with selfishness, self-focus. Repentance is our only access to God. It's the only thing that... that that gives us a hearing with Him. Um, and repentance is what makes Him the happiest. <laughs> you know? Um, and this is why Jesus was more complimentary of the prostitutes and the thieves and the tax collectors than He was with the religious leaders. Um, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the thieves, they, they knew they were sinners. They knew they couldn't impress God with their behavior. They brought with empty hands, or they came with empty hands to God. All they had was their sin. All they could do was turn from that sin. All they could say is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, I, I don't think we really grapple well with the depth of of God's love for us. Um, I don't. I don't think I do. I don't. I, his, his love, I don't think, 
captures me, amazes me the way that it should. Um, and because of that, I don't think I repent very well. Um, let me ask you to do something right now. Just in your mind, um, think of some issue, some struggle, some hardship, some aspect of suffering, some big issue in your life that makes it hard for you. Um, you got it? You thinking of it? Now what I want you to do, you can close your eyes if you want to, is I want you to do two things. I want you to first repent of not believing in the goodness of God in light of that issue. Not believing in His good plan for you. Not believing in His power. Not believing in His love. And then I want you to know that in the midst of that issue, your Father in heaven loves you. Um, you're His. Um, his heart is to search diligently and He won't stop until He finds you. Folks, we have a God who searches, who looks for us, who comes after us, who burns costly oil as it was and sacrifices, uh, who sweeps, who wastes time as it were, searching diligently for us as His people. And then when He finds us, and when He brings us to repentance, He leads all of heaven in celebration. And He does it every single time we repent. Not a one-time thing. Every single time we repent. Repentance is what makes God happy. Let's pray. <clears throat> My goodness, Father, I don't think any of us believe that. I don't think I believe it well enough. Um, if I really believe that repentance is what captures your heart, I would repent far quicker, far more often. Instead, I worry and I fret about this and that. Um, I get angry, I get depressed. Um, Father, help us to repent. Because you rejoice. Your heart for your people is a heart of rejoicing when you bring us to repentance. Um, we need your Spirit, Father, to apply these truths to our life, and so we ask for that. Uh, and we commit these truths to you in Jesus' name. Amen.